Why should anyone read your writing unless it's their literal job? Answering this question is probably one of the hardest things about writing for students, and not just for students. Scientists, journalists, professors, and all kinds of other real people grapple with this question all of the time, and now it's your turn. My name is Lucia Zaitseva, and I'm the founder of IvyWrite.com. I also teach writing at Harvard University. And in today's video, I'm going to be going over how you can get from that sort of descriptive, boring thesis that we've all written before to a genuinely cool and interesting one that someone other than your grandma will care about. First, I'll go over the concept of stakes. Then I'll talk about how to locate them when you're working with a single source. And then I'll discuss what needs to evolve about your thesis when you're working not with one source, but with several. And finally, I'll offer a concrete bonus tip for how you can apply what you've learned to your own thesis. So let's get going. The thing that makes your writing worthwhile is called your stakes. No, not that kind, which you'll remember if you've seen virtually any other video in this series. Your essay's stakes are the answer to the all-important questions, so what and who cares? And we're finally ready to dive deep enough into this topic to discuss how you can systematically go about answering those questions. As you know by now, an introduction has to state the central claim of that essay, because otherwise the reader will have no idea where the author, a perfect stranger, is trying to take them, and they'll also have precisely no reason to keep reading. So let's look at the following thesis statement and see how you can give your reader a reason to stay. Imagine you encounter a thesis that says, the protagonist of Leslie Neka Arima's short story, Who Will Greet You at Home, Ogechi, rejects the path to happiness that her society lays out for her and chooses instead to pursue unrealistic goals. Now, you've probably never heard of this short story, which makes it an ideal candidate for our purposes today, because you're probably thinking, why should I care about a short story, and why should I care about a fictional character who doesn't even exist? Plus, if you've seen my video on the thesis test, which I'll link here, you should be able to tell if this thesis is any good. So before we go any further, go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure that out. Okay, hopefully we're on the same page that this one definitely isn't, because anyone who's read the story would be able to say the exact same thing, which means that this thesis as it stands is not really debatable. In other words, this writer isn't bringing anything new to the party. So let's go ahead and take our observation that the character in the story pursues a really inconvenient path to happiness and make an inference about it. An inference is just a conclusion you reach based on evidence and reasoning. In this case, let's assume that because she could in theory pursue less uphill paths to happiness, Ogechi must be at least partially responsible for her own misfortunes. Specifically, if you're curious, in this fantastical story, women get to fashion their babies out of raw material, and whereas Ogechi is from a lower social class and so she should stick to simple, cheap material like clay and mud and sticks, she insists on trying to make really fancy and delicate babies who will never withstand the difficulties of her way of life. So knowing all this, we might revise our original thesis the following way. The protagonist of Leslie Neka Arima's short story, Who Will Greet You at Home, Ogechi, is at least partially responsible for her own plight. That just got a lot better because now our thesis is something a reasonable person could disagree with. And I wish I could say our job was done, but it's not. Now, imagine you, a teacher, or some super rude person comes up to the author of this thesis and says, So what? Or who cares? If instead your thesis had been, I found the elixir for eternal life and it can be yours for only $19.99, the answer to that question would be, I'm solving the problem of mortality, you idiot, and your stakes would be pretty clear because you'd have to be crazy not to care about outsmarting mortality. That clearly really matters and no one else is offering it to me for the low, low price of $19.99, so I'm all ears. But how do you make an argument for why what you're saying matters when you're not helping humans live forever or like solving the problem of global childhood poverty? That's admittedly a little bit harder for the author, but it also makes it a really rewarding mental exercise. And lest you think that whatever it is you're writing about is too boring to possibly say anything interesting about, then just take my word for it that there's plenty of stakes to be found all around us if we're just willing to dig deep enough. Back to that rude stranger for a second. Answers that are not going to satisfy them are, well, I care, or I need to write this essay to pass my class, or you, my teacher, literally told me to write this essay. If it doesn't matter, then what kind of sick joke is this? 
But if none of those answers are going to satisfy us, then what will? I want you to think of steaks like a nesting doll or an onion, but let's say onion because it's weirder. The innermost layer of the onion is the one closest to the text. It's the thing that helps you understand the importance of your theme or topic to the text that you're examining. And the thesis we looked at a moment ago was starting to do that because it helped us make sense of the character's numerous struggles. But we don't even know who this lady is, so why should we care if she's the architect of her own misery or not? At this point, it would be helpful to zoom out and remember that even though this is a work of fiction, if it's any good at all, then the author must have made really deliberate choices to paint her characters the way she does. And furthermore, the superpower of all good art is that it tends to reflect something interesting about the human experience. So now we can improve this thesis by including into the equation the author, or puppet master, if you will. And if we did that, we might come up with something like this. By painting Ogechi as the partial architect of her own struggles, Arima suggests that she is not wholly the victim of circumstance. You'll notice just now that I took care to say Arima suggests, and I could have also said Arima shows or Arima reveals, but what you won't find me saying are things like Arima wants to show or Arima intends, and there's a really important reason for that. And here it is. How would you feel if, without ever talking to you, someone went around making claims about what you were secretly thinking or feeling? Probably not great, so you don't want to do that to the authors that you read either. And unless you're doing diligent outside research, all you have to go on are the words on the page. And we're well within our rights to make careful inferences about those without having to resort to mind reading. When I say things like Arima shows or Arima reveals or Arima suggests, I'm actually making a claim about how the evidence or raw data of that text should be understood. In other words, I'm making an inference, and another reasonable reader could definitely disagree with me, but if they did, it would be because they took the same starting set of facts as I did and came to a different conclusion about them, not because they made some stuff up and I made some other stuff up and our stuff is different. Nah. So to sum up what we've done so far, we took an observation about a short story that was obvious and anyone who also read that short story would have been able to tell you. We made it more interesting by taking a leap from mere observation to inferring something about it. And then we made that even more interesting by remembering that any written text we're going to give the time of day to is purposefully and carefully constructed. So it makes sense to think about what the author might have meant when she wrote it the way she did. But even this third and final version could stand to be better, because even now we're still just making a claim about a fictional character in one short story that your reader may not have even read, and that can only ever take you so far. The good news is that if your thesis passes the thesis test from video 3, then the chances are very, very good that it actually resonates with something important about the world at large. In other words, if your thesis is genuinely non-obvious, arguable and worth writing about, then you're probably onto something and your job is just to figure out what that something is so you can convey it to your reader. Let's take a look at how this might play out in our particular example by connecting the theme that this thesis is interested in thinking about with that same theme as it resonates with the world that we all live in. And again, notice that we're zooming out progressively from the words on the page that anyone with eyes can see to broader and broader circles of significance. For instance, we might revise our thesis along the following lines. By painting Ogechi as the partial architect of her own struggles, Arima suggests that women, and perhaps people in general, always have agency even in the most challenging circumstances. Wow, I'm really good at this. That's such a stakesy thesis. Ogechi is a woman, women's struggles are human struggles, and struggle is part of life. You probably never thought you'd hear me say this, but for a single source paper, this is plenty of stakes and you can stop here. And again, note that we didn't have to be mind readers or make things up about the author without doing any actual research in order to get here. Instead, we made an arguable claim about what the author quite simply does. In other words, we made an inference based on careful observation. And if anyone disagrees with us, it's because they're coming to different conclusions about the same set of facts, or because they're giving more weight to some facts than others. But what if you were working with multiple sources and you could, for example, build in actual evidence about Arima's intentions by including something she said in an interview or potentially all kinds of other relevant information? Then we could do better than the most recent thesis we were just talking about, and in fact, you'd kind of have to, because as the scope of your argument expanded, your thesis would need to change, and your stakes would have to expand with it. 
For instance, we might have a source that gives us background information about Arima as an author, or maybe we've read other short stories in her collection so that we could talk about how this short story fits into that broader context. In that case, here's an example of something you might add to the good thesis we just developed a moment ago. In doing so, the story points to a broader tendency within Arima's writing to invite her readers to empathize with complex female characters while at the same time not letting these characters off the hook completely for their hand in their own struggles. That's awesome. We just contextualized a talented author's short story within her whole short story collection in the process giving our readers real insight into a recurring theme in her work. There's one more step to take though, and I promise this is the last one. What if whatever was going on in this author's work resonated somehow with authors who came before her or perhaps with her contemporaries? That being the case, you might even develop the stakes we talked about a moment ago to consider how Arima's work fits within the context of other short story writers, perhaps other women writers, other African writers or Nigerian writers, or maybe other magical realist writers. You might even speculate how she might have been influenced by the work of a prominent magical realist author, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. That's incredible, and to think we started with a boring, non-debatable observation about the text, and now we've gotten to a veritable treasure trove of possibilities. And along the way, without promising our reader eternal life or a really good deal on an extended car warranty, we've given them a reason to actually want to read this essay, which at first glance just appeared to be explaining something about someone who doesn't even exist. Now that we've said all that, here's a concrete action step you can apply to your own writing. As you know from the fourth video of this series, to make sure that you actually know what you're arguing, it's helpful to put in the header of your document, in this essay I argue that. And now we can revise our formula a little. To make sure that what you're arguing actually has stakes, go ahead and add the words, and this matters because. Of course, this is pretty clunky language, and you're welcome and even encouraged to move away from it as you feel more comfortable. But for starters, it's a pretty helpful way to check that you yourself know why what you're saying matters. For example, if we had done this with the good thesis we just developed together, it might have looked something like this. And this matters because Ogechi's story resonates with human struggles more broadly, and because even when she seems stuck between impossible choices, we see she is not as helpless as she initially appears. Now that you know about stakes, I hope you'll start to notice them in writing you encounter out in the wild, and realize that whenever you take the time to read something someone else has written, especially when you don't even know who they are, it's because they've managed to convince you, whether you're aware of it or not, that what they're writing about matters. If you enjoyed this video, please support the channel by subscribing and by sharing it with a friend. Oh, and one last thing. You might have noticed that earlier in this video, I did us a solid by picking an aspect of the text that I knew would yield a really interesting thesis. In the next video, we'll back up a step so I can show you how I did that, and I'll also give you really concrete conceptual tools that you can apply to your own writing to make sure that your arguments always matter to yourself and to other people. So get excited, and I'll see you then.